Hi! Hey, Fenske. Oh. Okay, you've got some really interesting names. I'm sorry. Urban Sketches Stuttgart. Hello. Hi. Mario is on. So is Rita. So is Lotte Broger. I. Okay, I'm gonna stop trying to pronounce all those interesting Instagram handles that are there. I see some amazing people who are starting to get on the show today. Hello, hi, welcome everybody to another episode of USK Dogs. I'm coming to you from my little corner in Hong Kong. How are you guys? Have you had a good week? I hope you have. Thanks so much for joining me and starting my week off. It is midnight here in Hong Kong, as you well know. And for those of you who are wondering, who have caught the announcement before, just in case you were not aware, in a few short weeks, now we're going to shift our time. We shall announce that soon. We'll shift our time so that another part of the world gets to join us live and have fun and hang out. Woohoo! So many people from Hong well, hey, from Hong Kong. I see Stephanie. Hey. Hi, dear Rob. Thanks for losing sleep. I can't sleep. I am so looking forward to this every Sunday. Okay, so I hope you guys have been having, you guys and gals have been having a really good week. We have an amazing show for you today. I, and I'm wondering, as we kick things off, how you've been finding the last couple of months or so. I think many of us around the world have been on lockdown. And I'm sure that a lot of you have signed up for workshops and physical classes to push your sketching and they've been canceled, right? I mean, I've signed up for, for a couple as well and it was so disappointing. Go, I see somebody say, go Rob. Oh, really? Hi, from Sydney, wow. From Sydney, it's 2 a.m. Thank you for joining us. From Toronto, from Pakistan, whoa. Texas, from France. Hey, hello all. Hi everyone. Okay, so. Um, I know that a lot of you have also signed up for workshops and stuff like that. And, and it, when they're being canceled, sometimes we ask ourselves, like, how are we going to push ourselves? How are we going to um, stop ourselves from making the same sketching mistakes? Sometimes we just want to get out of a rut or try something new. Well, today's show is going to address some of those things. Hi from Berkeley. Hi from Menses. From Memphis, from Oakland, California, from Russia, woo, from Brighton, UK. Hey, everybody, welcome. Thanks for joining us for another episode of USK Talks. Today, our guests are two incredible people. They've got incredible reputations, not just as really nice people, but also as incredible educators in their fields. So you've seen the poster, you know who they are. There's some of my, I, I, it's very hard for me to say our favorites, but I do really, really, really like these two sketches. We've got Matt and we've got Sherry, and they've come here. They're going to share with us a whole bunch of awesome tips and tricks and exercises because just as our bodies need to work out, so do our sketching muscles, you know, to sharpen our skills and keep things toned and keep pushing. So. Let's try and get our first guest on the show. We have all the way from Montreal, the Queen. What time Good. is it there in Montreal right now? Noon, lunchtime. It's noon, it's lunch. Have you had lunch already or no, is it gonna be after no. the show? No, later, later. <laughs> later, okay. Well, Sherry, you have so many fans on the show. People are going, hi, Sherry, hi, Sherry, hi, Sherry. So lots of people know you. But for the, the tiny percentage that does not, would you kindly introduce yourself and tell us? Absolutely. What, yeah. Sure. Uh, so I'm Sherry from Montreal, and uh, mm -hmm. I was born here, and I've lived here all my life in this beautiful Canadian city. And uh, I'm a graphic designer. That was my training. That was what I studied in university. So. Uh, I've always worked as a graphic designer and then I taught graphic design, but on the side, I've always been a watercolor painter and that's really my true love. Uh -huh. Uh-huh. Watercolor painter. Well, you, you're, you're well known for your watercolors and I've got to say, I'm an iPad guy all the way, but when I first saw your work, I was like, 
oh my goodness, should I go back to traditional media? <laughs> I must say, I was really tempted. And, I'm, and I was so touched um, in Porto when I wanted to take your class. And it was a watercolor class. And Shari was so sweet. She said, OK, you can come join us with your iPad. So thank you so much for that. Oh, that meant sure, a lot. sure. <laughs> Well, yeah, so I, anyway, I, you know, no, I was just going to say I started painting mm -hmm. watercolor when I was in my mm -hmm. teens, believe it or not, with mm -hmm. a teacher from Montreal. So that's how long I've been doing it, a long time. Um, speaking of anybody, say that again. I got all that. Oops. Okay. Sure. So Maybe I'll take these see, off. Should I take? Can you hear? I can't hear okay. you. Let's try again. I'll try. I'll take these off, and maybe it'll be better. We'll put them away. Okay. Okay. So, for those of you, if there are technical glitches, we apologize. It's Instagram, there. There. and it's a little bit better. Better. Okay. 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 Yeah. So, just, yeah, then, you're, you're, just so I miss a couple of things. Ahead. Uh, some people are saying, I'm picking up something that you're breaking up. We will not go. You Let's are breaking up it. for me. It's such a shame. I can't hear you. I can't hear you. Um, oh, can you hear me now? Right now? Can you hear me now? Better? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's start yes. again. We're back. Okay. We are yeah. back. Yes, let's start again. Okay, so as we dive in, maybe Shari, you can, can you tell us how did you come to master watercolor so well? Okay. I think everybody wants to know that. Everybody wants to know. Um, I was really lucky yeah. when I was in my teens. I studied with someone named Ed Whitney. And he. Mm -hmm. I, I went down to Maine to take classes with him, and he was like the master teacher of all the teachers in watercolor in the States. And from okay. then, I studied with Ed Whitney, and I studied with Frank Webb, and Barbara Nietzsche, and a lot of different watercolor painters, Milford oh, Zorns, and so I was, I was very lucky um, that okay. I had that opportunity when I was young. Okay. And how, how old were you when you started doing all that? Oh, when you I was sent probably some... 18, 19, 20. Wow. Yeah, yeah, okay. a long time ago. Is, is this one of your earlier sketches then? That's one of my earlier sketches. And the reason that I wanted to tell you about that one was that mm -hmm. um, when I first started painting in watercolor, uh, the sketch was a very different thing. The sketch was just the preparation for the painting. So the sketch was kind of like a discard. You just like, you did your sketch, you figured out the composition, you figured out the design, and then you went to uh, do the painting. So I think you probably have the, the watercolor there, one of my very mm -hmm. old watercolors. And uh, that was done in Cinque Terre in Italy. And uh, wow. that, yeah, so that was, you know, that's a half sheet watercolor, 15 by 22 inches. And uh, that was the purpose of the sketch was always just like, figure out the watercolor and then paint it. So that yeah, so that is to that. that to that. Yeah, that tiny sketch. And wow. um, yeah, so then I painted in watercolor for many, many years. And then I had kids mm -hmm. and uh, they're now in their 20s. And so I stopped painting for a very long time. And then did the you? Oh, yeah, oh. yeah, 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 yeah. Well, and, I was and when did you get a, back into it? I got back every day. <laughs> And not oh. long after, I discovered Urban Sketchers. And I see. then it was a revelation because then it was like, oh, the sketch is the end product. <laughs> That's so much more fun. Yeah. So then, yeah. I, I, then I, yeah, then I found Urban Sketchers and then I went mm -hmm. to my first symposium in Santo Domingo and uh, the oh. rest is history. Met wow. all, all these great people like you. Yes. And yeah. Well, I, I remember meeting you very briefly the first time in Singapore. And, and you were so nice. So thank you for that as well. Well, you I think were some, so nice, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that, I mean, there are a lot of sketchers who are on the show now. And something that many people don't realize is that sketchers, whether you're an educator or an instructor, 
I, I would say 99.999% of sketches are really, really nice people. So don't feel intimidated. Go up and say hi, you know, start a conversation. Don't you think? That's what makes our organization and our community so wonderful. It's that, it's that sense yeah. of, you know, and it just goes to show that how, um, you know, how connected we are still during this time of isolation and lockdown. It's yeah. just, we're yeah. still trying to find great ways to stay in touch. And that's pretty amazing, right? Yes, I think, I think so too. Yeah. Eileen from San Francisco just said, what a tribe. And yes, that's yes. exactly it. What absolutely. a tribe. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, well. I have to ask you this. I was just going through your Instagram feed. And for those of you who are not following Shari, I cannot imagine who that would be. I'm putting up uh, Shari and Matt's Instagram handles up on the screen right now. And I was just looking through and, and I was just seeing how you, you tend to do this thing where you paint something very familiar over and over again. And I love this series that you've done here. Let me get that off the page at, how do you say it? San Miguel de, San Allende? Miguel de Allende in Mexico. De Allende. De Allende. And de Allende. Oh. That's right. De Allende. Okay. Please tell us why you do this and, and what you learn from it, because I'm just going to swipe through really quickly as you go through it. I can swipe back. Sure. But I, I yeah. love this when you showed this on your feed. All those Instagram. different views. Well, I'll yes. tell you a little. I'll tell you a little bit yeah. about um, about Please. that. I I arrived and um, I was giving a workshop in San Miguel de Allende, and I arrived at night, and um, so I didn't really see what it looked like. But in the morning, when I opened the curtains from my room, I could see this incredible view with distant mountains and this beautiful sunrise. And um, I had just read a book about uh, a new technique of combining gouache and watercolor. So I had mm -hmm. thrown a little tube of white gouache into my, whoops, that's the old one, uh, into yeah. my bag. And um, I, I saw that view and that was the first one. I just, I had to paint it. So I only had 30 minutes in the morning and I painted one. And the idea there was just to be able to, as quick as I could uh, with watercolor and gouache, capture the colors of that view. And it was rapidly changing because it was sunrise. So mm -hmm. after I did one, I became totally addicted. And then I set my alarm every morning um, and I had to just get up every morning. And my aim was in 30 minutes just to capture uh, and see how quickly I could mix paint, uh, learn a new technique at the same time of mixing that white gouache with watercolor and just capture that changing view. And I did that wow. on, tone, on toned paper, a little like five inches by seven inches, sort of postcard size. And... Um, wow. I just learned so much about mixing color uh, during the, those little half hours, and I did 10 in all. So that's wow. the story with those. I love that. And and I love the idea also to just spend a half hour because it's tempting to think that, oh, it, it needs to be finished. But yeah, this is, yeah, this is I, so cool. I also think, yeah, if we, if we limit the time that we that we take sometimes you just do the essentials and those are the most important parts of uh you know of what you're sketching and it taught me a lot about atmospheric perspective too because those mountains that were in the distance i could sometimes see and sometimes not so it taught me a lot about color and warm and cool colors and mixing those and how things looked that were closer to me and further away yeah it was oh, a great yeah. it was a great learning experience yeah, there yeah, they are. There they are. <laughs> yeah, they're, 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 they're really fantastic. And what I thought that was, was very interesting is also that you use watercolor a lot. But in this instance, you actually, you, did you say it's a mix of gouache and watercolor? Right. So I just, I just read a book. I, I read a lot. And when I buy mm -hmm. a book on someone's technique, the first thing that I do is I, I quickly go to the page where I see their color palette because I love color. So this was uh, Nathan Folk's uh, book mm. on painting landscapes quickly and beautifully. So he, he uses just a tube of white gouache and he mixes it with watercolor. And I thought, wow, instead of carrying, you know, 10 tubes of gouache, I could just mix. I already have all these watercolors. So I could right. just mix my watercolor with this oh. white gouache. So that's why I tried right. that. Yeah. Okay. Great technique. Yeah, I think it is. It's really effective. And I mean, just talking about using slight, something a little bit different and throwing in a spin. I can see also on your Instagram feed, and I'm sure a lot of your followers could realize that you play around with different tools and materials all the time. 
all the time. I, mean, I was just looking. I was just looking at your kitchen counter series, and oh, there's gouache, and there's something that looks like pen, and there's watercolor, and so many casein, things. Casein. I tried casein, and I did ink, oh. and yeah, I did. I did ten of those too on my kitchen counter. Wow. And, uh, yeah, and that was fun too. So yeah. Okay. Well, can you tell us a little about this and about experimentation with tools then? Sure. Um, well, that was um, a bottle of Noodler's Apache Sunset uh, ink. And it's a beautiful ink. It's orange, but when you dilute it, it turns yellow. So all that is done just with one color. And, a, and uh, I think I used a dip pen and uh, then a brush to dilute the ink. And I find when I, when I take take just when I use just one tool I learn a lot about it like you know if you go to a symposium and you have the the goodie bag we always get so many amazing things in there so what I do is I I put them all in a drawer and um, in the winter when it's when I can't get outside because it's cold in Montreal and I can't sketch outside I take out those things one by one and I really examine and figure out how they work so like I'll take one paint color or one ink color and uh, just play with it. So that's what I discovered about that Apache Sunset is that it's orange when it's full strength, but when you dilute it, it turns a completely different color. And uh, so that was really fun to play with. So I, yeah, I, I, don't know, I, just, I, I just love trying new materials. Yeah. And, yeah, I, and, every, I, and every time I, I use one of those, then I think that's something I could use in my watercolor in a different way. Mm. You know, like I, I bring the new back to the familiar. Right. That's okay. Kind of cool. And and would you suggest this as a as a method for everyone to sort of get out of the comfort zone kind of thing? Then. Oh yeah, so. absolutely. Like here, I have. Can I show one of these? Um, yeah, please. Yeah. So this is one of the ones. Can you see it? Um, this is one of the ones that I did from my kitchen counter, yeah, and um, I remember. I did, um, I did this one in ink, in India ink, and uh, what it taught me was that, um, you know, you can use India ink. I mean, Joanna Krimmel uses that all the time, and I just love her work. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, she, she, instead of drawing with India ink, which we normally think of, she paints with it and she dilutes it. So mm -hmm. one of the things that I, when I was working on that kitchen series um, and using that ink was that, um, I kind of created an emphasis and a focus on these white uh, tulips that I had, and the rest mm -hmm. was kind of all in darkness. And mm -hmm. um, that taught me a lot about even, you know, this scene on my kitchen counter, um, kind of about creating mood. And yeah. uh, that's something that, you know, using lights and darks like that is something that I'm going to bring to my watercolor when I can get out and paint on location uh, again. Yeah. Well, so, I love the, I, I love that. That's such a simple little lesson, but that's true. When we play around with stuff, there's always something we can take back and, and incorporate into our regular work. Absolutely. Yeah. All the time. All the time. Okay. Well, I love the fact that, I mean, just looking at some of these and the way you work in monochrome as well, can you tell us a little bit about what you do with, with all these value studies? Sure. Um, well, that was one that, again, was experimentation with one tube of color. So I had uh, sepia paint, and uh, that's just looking out the kitchen window, which is right next to me, and that's my glass table, my uh, table that we sit at in the summer when we want to eat outside. And um, when I saw the reflection on that table of the, the trees uh, that were surrounding it, and the white and black, it was so abstract, and yeah. um, it, it, was so, it was so beautiful, and so, um, I guess, you know, for me, when I'm painting in watercolor and I want to make an effective sketch, uh, more important than color is value, lights and darks. So um, I practice a lot because I think sometimes in watercolor, we have a tendency to add too much water. So I'm always fighting with myself to, to add more uh, pigment and get the darks right. So practicing with values really helps me to, to push the darks. And uh, mm. what was amazing about that scene was that it was kind of a, it was after some, uh, it was after rain and it was, it was very foggy outside. So everything else was kind of gray, but uh. Uh, the sky reflected on the table and, uh, and, the, um, uh, and the trees reflecting on the table 
were the focus in that sketch. So I really wanted to play with that contrast of light and dark and that abstraction in the middle. But I think about, you know, I always look at a scene and think about lights and darks before I think about mm -hmm. color. So that's what monochrome does for me. It makes me see that. Yeah. I think it's, it's, it's like one of the fundamentals, but it's so powerful. And I love how you, these are all just whites that you left, right? So then, right. then you washed it off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. Wow. That That's was a fun so one. That's so cool. Yes. Well, there are lots of people who, who are also struggling with the, the current circumstances and they're trying to find stuff to draw and all that. And what I realize is that you do a lot of drawing from life. Is that a conscious decision? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, to me, I guess drawing from life um, uh, has so many uh, advantages. One is that the process um, for me is almost like meditation. So sitting down to draw is, mm -hmm. is like meditation for me every day. Mm -hmm. um, but also it's like a musician doing scales. If I don't draw every day, I feel, I feel kind of rusty. So mm. I like to draw to, just to keep the skills sharp. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, it, it's just, I, I feel, it's like oxygen. You know, somebody, somebody, <laughs> somebody asked me, um, somebody asked me like, how do you make yourself draw every day? And I said, I don't have to make myself draw every day. I, I need to draw every day. I have to draw every day. So, sure. um, so that yeah. that series um and i think there's three in that series um yeah. they were drawn on march 14th and you know for all of us going through this COVID situation uh that week was a very significant week um and i was teaching uh in the states in south carolina and um i was supposed to go to washington dc just to go to the museums and had to change my flight to come home and that was in the in the washington airport and i think that week was the week that, um, you know, the word uh, pandemic uh, became a word uh. instead of epidemic. And um, everybody was going home. Everybody had to just, wherever they were, like me, had to get home. Borders were closing, airports were shutting. So for me, um, that those drawings of people looking at their phones, looking so worried, um, like I will never forget that in my sketchbook, just sitting there and absorbing that process um, they're, they're very significant because uh, they represent a, a period in time. And I think, you know, for all of us who have been drawing during this period, our sketchbooks will become very important because they are a record of, of this mm -hmm. time and it's very, it's very unique. So that's sort of the start of those, uh, you know, and, and like, uh, like every time you sit somewhere and draw, you remember the circumstances. Uh, it's not like taking a photo. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's true. And as I get older, I find that I need to draw it to remember where I've been or what I did because it, it helps me to create these rich memories. Absolutely. Um, I, 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 do you find that as well? Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm not the only one. Yes, no, you're not the only one. You're not the only one. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, you go back through your sketchbooks. I'm not, I don't know if that's the same for you, but you go back through your sketchbooks and it, you know, it's not just a visual, but I mean, you know, you hear sounds, there's smells right. and all of that comes back yeah. when you look at your sketches. Yeah, yeah there's, there's something about sketching that sort of encodes with, encodes all the senses that we, we, we had open and Absolutely. all the awareness around us it, yeah. it pulls that into our drawings. I think yeah. that's really, really so special. And uh, which, which brings me to the, my next question then, what do you think it is about, uh, drawing from life that is so different from just drawing from a photo, for instance? Um, well, I guess for me, I mean, uh, I do occasionally in the winter when I'm doing a big painting, mm -hmm. I do sometimes use a photo reference. So it's not that I never mm -hmm. use a photo, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I, it's not, it's definitely not my preference. I, I would 100% prefer to draw from life. So for me, mm -hmm. there's several things. Um, first of all, uh, for me, a photo stops time. So what mm -hmm. I like paint, you know, painting from life oh. is that um, I like changing shadows, changing light, people moving through the scene and things like that. Um, so, you know, that's the one important thing. The other thing yeah. is, and that's an example that I, I took. So um, I did that sketch on location, but when I'm on location, I always take a photo just in case like a, mm -hmm. usually a truck parks in front of me or 
you know, right. so I always take a reference photo. So that that's in old Montreal. And mm -hmm. um, the scene at the top um, is the one I painted on location. And you can see all the colors in the shadow areas, right? There, mm -hmm. There's so yeah. much beautiful detail and subtlety. Oh, and yeah reflected light and all kinds of things you know that's that's one of the oldest buildings in Montreal and recently I, I came across I was looking through my photo archives and I came across the reference photo that I took at the time I forgot even that I had it and I thought uh -huh. wow you know if I had painted that from a photo it would have been a very different result because yes. the, the shadow areas are so uninteresting you know they're just gray and right. um, so uh, you know so so there's that. So the photo, um, it, you know, in the dark areas, you lose all the detail. And then in the light areas, you lose all the detail, too. Plus, um, when you take a photo, the camera makes a decision, right? The lens of the camera mm. is the eye. And right. so the camera makes a decision. And that's not necessarily what you would include. I mean, in this case, the, the photo and the sketch that I did on location are pretty similar. But sometimes I take a photo and then I look at the drawing that I did and uh, on location and they're very different because you're you're simplifying, you're making decisions, you know, things are changing. So I don't well, know, definitely uh, not not my preference of drawing from a photo, but, you know, I, it's cold here about seven months of the year. So uh, it's sometimes well, hard to get out. <laughs> Yes, but I've, I've noticed also the way that you draw around your home then, which is really inspiring. And just looking at this as an example, I mean, this is so rich. And you're right, if, if I were to paint this from a photo, I would be tempted to try and re reproduce those colors. And they're so dead. Yeah. You know, whereas this yeah. is filled with life and light. And I think that alone is like a compelling reason to you know, open our eyes up and, and look around and paint from yeah, life. Yeah, yeah, like often the, the, all that beauty is in the shadows. And when you take a yeah. picture, there's there's nothing left in the shadows. It's just yeah, dark. It's, it's just flattened it's, and dead. That is yeah. true. So, so I would rather just draw something on my counter um, any day in my house, if I'm stuck in my house, or a view from mm -hmm. my window, than draw mm -hmm. from a photo. Because okay. the excitement, and that was the other thing that I forgot to mention, um, for me, the real excitement is the conversion from, from looking at the three-dimensional world and putting it down on, on a two-dimensional surface on, on your paper. But mm -hmm. that's gone completely when you take a photo because that's already been done. Right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You, you, there's so much lost in that, in that process. Yeah. So, and it, yeah. it's actually easier. I find it's easier to draw from a photo, but it's just, there's a lifelessness about it. Completely. No excitement yeah. there. No excitement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what would you, I mean, I, I love, I'm, I've seen a few already comments. They talk about your wheelbarrows <laughs> and I love your wheelbarrows. I love Shari's garbage can paintings as well. We don't have those examples, but I think that's one of the first things I saw on your Instagram feed or maybe it was on Facebook before. And I was like, oh my God, I think she can make garbage cans look enticing. You know, how cool is that? Well, we're not going to talk about garbage cans, but I wanted to then ask you to give the audience some advice. I mean, there are a lot of people who are looking out their windows. Maybe they don't have many. Like I, I live in a home with like one window facing the back of a hotel. That's what I see. But how can you take something that you see every day and make it interesting? So I'd like to use your wheelbarrows for, as, as an example. Can you yeah, talk to absolutely. us about that? Please? So I just, yeah, so my, my old wheelbarrow is leaning up against uh, the oak tree in my backyard. And okay. I see it, I see it all the time. I mean, I see it every day and I've drawn it maybe, I mean, people know. Uh, actually, people say, how come that wheelbarrow never gets used? Because uh, <laughs> it's really just a model, but um, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, it really looks beautiful at different times of day and in different seasons. So mm -hmm. I try to use it as a way to learn. And so even if the view is really boring, and I mean, at least I have a wheelbarrow in my view, so it's not that boring, but I use it as a way to look at color and look at light and see how things change. Um, one winter, my neighbor's fence fell down. So then I had a different view, which was kind of nice until he, until he fixed it and put it up. <laughs> But I, I do use it as a way to learn. So um, I've drawn it at least like 20 or 30 times. That one's in brush pen. Um, 
Uh, that one's a, a really dark day and there was just a bit of rain uh, kind of glistening on the wheelbarrow. I've done it in monochrome. I've done it in single, you know, single uh, paint colors. I've done it in ink. Um, wow. That one was a nice one. I did that in, I think, in Payne's Gray and the morning light was on it. Um, I do it sometimes in winter, sometimes in summer. And uh, like I said, it's just always a learning experience. It's, it's also happens to be uh, kind of a hard object to draw. So uh, because of the shape. And so it's, of course, easier to draw in winter when it's covered by snow. Uh, and so I draw it in winter and I draw the snow shadows. Um, so, so even if you have a, you know, a boring view, um, it's kind of nice to use it just to try different materials. So I, you know, that one in monochrome, going back to working in values, I was really comparing uh, values, how, you know, what's the lightest light, what's the darkest dark in there, um, and how can I simplify the shapes and really show the light in there. And I love, I love sunny days, but I also like uh, just, you know, different, uh, different times of day, like I did, uh, you know, the sunrise ones in San Miguel de Allende. So mm -hmm. those are my wheelbarrows. Yeah. They're, and they're incredible, which is a perfect segue for the challenge that you have for our yes, audience today. Yes, I do. I do have a challenge. So, okay. um, so the challenge is to look out uh, your window or the view that you have and at different times of day, draw the same view and um, draw, uh, you know, uh, differences in color or value. Um, and just see what you can observe uh, by drawing at different times of the day. So there's my wheelbarrow with different shadows on it on, on bright days and on dark days. And um, I really look forward to what people do with this challenge. Yes, I'm so excited to see that as well. I mean, just an, as an example of how seriously Shari takes the wheelbarrows. Look at that. I mean, that is incredible. You've got, you've done all kinds of studies on that. Yeah. And I could, and I'm, I'm sorry, we, we didn't, we didn't quite get to it. There are so many fans of your snow paintings. They want to know how do you mix the colors on snow and how did you, how do you get about doing that? I think we'll, we'll have to get you back on the show just to talk about oh, painting I'll snow. I'll talk about snow, sure. Another time. <laughs> Another day. Another time. Okay, well, before we let you go, um, Shari, we have the lightning round that everybody loves as well. Can you just very quickly show us some of your favorite tools that you use sure, when you're absolutely. out in pain? Yeah, my yeah. very favorite brush. Let's see if mm -hmm. we can get it in here. Can you see it? So that's my favorite yes. brush. It's a, it's a rosemary rigger. And the rigger brush was, was traditionally used by British watercolors, I guess, to do ship's rigging. And I love wow. this because, yeah, it's very fine and I can draw and paint with it. So that's my favorite oh, brush. Right, okay. And my very More favorite, tools. my, yeah, my, my very favorite sketchbook now is an etcher sketchbook because it's got mm -hmm. thick watercolor paper. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's a scene that I did. So yeah, that's, those are my two favorite things that I've been using lately. Wow. Okay, yeah. well, final question before yeah. I, before we go. Uh, once the pandemic is over, what's the first place you want to go to to paint? Well, let's go back to Mario and Morocco. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that the, lots of people are interested in Morocco now. Yeah, okay. those Delacroix, the light, and oh, yeah, Morocco. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, we have to do like a, a group thing or something, I think. I think don't, so. Don't go, don't go by yourself, Shari. No, 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 meet in Morocco. Yeah, meet in that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. Final thing. Uh, would you like to tell some of our viewers, perhaps in French, what uh, just like a quick summary and about the challenge? Absolument. Pour tout le monde à Montréal et à Québec et en France, uh, si vous pouvez faire la même chose que moi, regardez une belle vue que vous avez uh, à plusieurs uh, instances pendant la journée, comme moi j'ai fait ma brouette et euh, de le faire le matin, le soir, et observer les couleurs, les ombres, et tout ça, et partager. J'aimerais oh. beaucoup voir ça. Merci. Wow. 
That yeah. that sounds so cool. I wish I understood that. <laughs> well, now you're making me want to learn French too. Okay. Well, no, that that will help so when we go to Morocco. Oh yeah, that's true. No, you're gonna be there for us, so you'll help sort that all that out. Yeah, <laughs> we'll go with Shari. Okay. Well, it's been amazing having you. Thank you so much, Shari, for sharing all that. Thank you. So uh, this is, yeah. I have my beautiful um, Roisin <gasps> mug from when I taught wow. in Galway. Isn't that gorgeous? That's Roisin sketches on there. Uh, oh, and, that is stunning. Um, yeah, and thank you. It's, I know there's lots of work that goes into this, and thank you for inviting me, for all of you on the team. It's been so much fun. And I can't well, wait to see what people post. Yes. Well, from the team, we thank you, Sherry, for being on the show, and we'll see you again. Thank yes. you, Rob. Okay, Bye. see you. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, so that was Sherry. Sherry, all the way from Montreal, thank you so much. Now we are waiting for our next guest. Matt, can you type a little something so that I can catch you? Because things have been so busy, I wasn't able to catch you earlier to pin you. But we've got Matt Brem coming up all the way from Idaho next. And he is an incredibly nice guy. I think the first, I probably met him the first time in Singapore. And I was thinking like, oh, he's so cool. You know, he's just this cool guy. And when you get him and Paul Houston together, the banter is fantastic. So, okay, Matt, Matt, can you type something in so that, oh yeah, there you are. Hey buddy, thank you so much. And we are going live, trying to get Matt in all the way from Idaho. Connecting, <laughs> yes, we're connecting. Hey, hi Matt, how are you? Hey, how you doing Rob? Good, good. I love this this new look that you've got. You look like a rock star. <laughs> you know, do you play guitar or something as well? Uh, you know, I do. Yes, you I do. do. Oh, <laughs> it works. Are you a bass player? No, no, guitar. Play? No. Okay. I mean, I can okay. play a little bit of bass, but okay. mainly guitar. Yeah. Okay. Well, that figures. I think, yeah. like, I mean, all these shows are so popular. There are tons of people around the world now who are drawing, and I think they're going to have a lot of fun drawing you. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a great portrait. It's my, uh, oh. yeah, I'd rather have shorter hair right now, frankly, yeah. but uh, this is the way it goes. <laughs> okay, well, it works. It works, and we're happy to have you. For those of us who just joined the show, we are talking to Matt Bram all the way from Idaho, and you're on USK Talk. So, Matt, uh, would you please uh, um, give us a little intro of where you're from, what you do, yeah. and yeah. Well, uh, originally from outside of Chicago, and uh, spent a little bit of time living on the East Coast in Washington, D.C., eventually moved out to the West Coast to go to graduate school for architecture. Uh, that's what I studied as an undergrad as well. And uh, and now I'm living in Idaho. I've been here about 15 years and I'm a professor of architecture wow. at the University of Idaho. And I teach uh, drawing is one of the main things that I teach. And I also bring a group of students each year to Rome to study. I've been doing that uh, since about 2007. Although this year's program is still a bit up in the air, we don't know if we're going to be able to make it. We'll see. Fingers crossed. Oh, what what time of the year do you usually go to, to Rome? Uh, now we go in the fall. So we okay. would be going September, October, November. Oh, so fingers crossed that that might still work out because Italy is just we'll starting to, to ease up on travel restrictions. We just heard, right? right? So right, right. hopefully, hopefully. We'll see. We'll see. Yes. So tell us, Matt, how long have you been drawing? Well, since I started architecture school in uh, 1984. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Little while, right? I mean, I drew as a kid. I think most of us drew to some degree as a kid, but I got serious about it uh, when I was in architecture school. Um, but then in terms of the kind of drawing that we do as urban sketchers, that, you know, was certainly part of what I was doing as a student. But then I got more serious about that when I started teaching in architecture. So that was uh, maybe 20, a little more than 20 years ago uh, that I started kind of studying drawing in a different way. Even though I could draw and I was going out and sketching from life on a 
fairly regular basis. I just started thinking about it differently and studying it differently when uh, I started having to teach it to other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, yeah, I guess I, I've noticed that too, when you need to teach something, you understand it on a different level in order to explain yeah. things. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you don't, I don't feel like as a teacher, I need to know everything. Uh, yeah. I feel like I, it's actually better if I approach teaching as a learning process myself. If I'm, you know, only a couple of steps ahead of people I'm working with, then it's, we have a better relationship about what we're both learning together. Uh, and so that's something I always try to keep in mind in terms of teaching drawing. Oh, that, that's really cool, and that's so not Asian. <laughs> Asian professors like, I don't have a <laughs> Don't question me. Well, right. not all, but yeah. <laughs> that, that, well, coming back to drawing then, uh, what sort of things were you doing, and what was really helpful for you and your process when you first started out as a beginner and you were trying yeah. to master drawing? Well, uh, you know, certainly we were taught um, how to draw by looking at other drawings when I was a student. And so that's something that stuck with me. Um, and it's funny, when I started teaching and really started trying to learn more and more about drawing, I kind of took a bit of a leap back in time. Um, at the time, you know, I, I went to college in the late 80s, mid to late 80s, and there was a very particular way of drawing that came out of the mm -hmm. 1960s, 70s, 80s in architectural rendering circles that I never gravitated toward. Uh, there was a particular kind of look to the, the architectural rendering. Um, it, it, I think it's effective and everything, but it just it always felt somewhat dated to me somehow. And so paradoxically, I kind of went back uh, even further and started finding books like like these. Uh, this is a pen and ink book by Arthur Guptill, uh, Drawing with Pen and Ink. And this one is my favorite, which is Sketching and Rendering in Pencil. Okay. Uh, and those books completely changed my worldview when it came to drawing. <laughs> They were okay. they were made in the 1920s. He also has one on color that is excellent. Mm -hmm. And there was like just a different level of rigor, I think, in terms mm -hmm. of the approach to drawing. And so I just started learning and learning and learning as much as I could from those books and a few others, but mainly it was the Arthur Guptill books. Um, and, and that, again, that changed the way that I drew by studying somebody else's approach to drawing from a different era. Uh, so that I found yeah. that really helpful. That's that's really interesting that in, instead of studying just photos, you start you're studying how people used to draw or you you find people that inspire you and you're looking yeah. studying how they draw. Basically yeah. Basically that that was, that was it, right? Yeah. That now, could, could you maybe do like an Instagram story and put up those those the, the covers of those books or something? Because I'm sure we're going to get a ton of questions like, what book was that? What book was that? And so head sure. over to, to Matt's Instagram yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, he, he'll talk about that. Okay, so uh, in the course of teaching as well, you've been you've written books on architecture, you've taught perspective, you've been teaching for decades now you've got so much experience and oh, wow. actually for those those who don't know matt he looks actually a lot younger <laughs> after, <laughs> after the haircut and uh, i mean he's actually a really handsome dude this is the rock star look but there's also the clean cut matt look who, who looks like you know very handsome guy. so um well coming coming back to my question then you, you, you've worked with decades of students like what sort yeah. of mistakes do you see your students making all over and over again, and how would you recommend that they stop? Uh, the number one thing that I find is that, um, for I don't know where it comes from, but for some reason, uh, a lot of my students, most of my students have this attitude that originality is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that when they're learning how to draw, it's about, originality. It's about doing things differently than other people. 
And and as far as I can tell, <laughs> that has meant that it really slows their progress. Uh, you know, it's super important that drawing, painting, th these things that we do, it is about personal expression. I, I get that fully and I embrace that. But uh, in the learning process, um, I think it's just so important that you learn just basic fundamentals. Um, how to make marks effectively, how to develop tone effectively, how to just, you know, draw trees in a convincing way, how to represent shadows in a convincing way. There are uh, sort of conventional ways of representing things with different materials like pencil or pen or watercolor. And then learning those conventions and really embracing them and making it, you know, Sherry was talking about doing scales um musically uh mm -hmm. developing muscle memory for an ability to do things to represent the world in a way that you don't have to think about every time you, you put pen to paper um so once you've done that and once you've learned a lot of different fundamental skills from a wide variety of sources i think that's mm -hmm. kind of critical like if you're only looking at one person's work your work is probably going to start looking like that person's work. Right. But if you're looking at a lot of people's work, then your work will become your own. You will have your own visual voice uh, that is sourced from a lot of really um, skilled people. It's like learning music. You learn to play by listening to other people who you like listening to. You don't learn to play by listening to people that you don't like to listen to. <laughs> so over time, your work starts to uh, exhibit a uniqueness that is yours, mm -hmm. but that is informed by skills, by fundamentals. And, and I think that's something that a lot of students kind of skip over. They want to they wanna speak with their own voice right away, right. But, but their work doesn't have <laughs> fundamentals that you know they don't have a vocabulary to work with yet i like i really like that analogy yes the the, the sketching vocabulary and the fundamentals yeah. so I, i'm so glad we have you on because i think that's something that a lot of sketches try like oh i, I want to draw like lapano i want to draw paint like shari or something like that but they don't have those basic skills yet so right. but what advice would you give for someone who's been at it a little bit and they might be stuck in a rut, for instance, and they just don't know how to improve. How would you, what would you suggest to someone in that situation? Well, I'll, I'll echo what Sherry said, certainly, uh, and what I think a lot of people are doing, which is just to do something different, um, to try a different technique, a different material, um, a different subject, um, you know, just to kind of break out of that sort of rut. But uh, I find myself that, that going back and kind of refocusing on fundamentals um, often makes me feel a different sense of ability and confidence about things. And too often, I don't do that. And so I find myself in situations where I wish I could draw in a particular way, but I'm rusty, as Sherry said earlier. Uh, you know, I, that happens to me a lot because I don't draw people very often, at least not kind of at close range sort of portrait people drawings. I, you know, I do figure drawing as much as I can, but mainly I'm drawing buildings and urban spaces. And then at symposiums, I find myself at the dinner table with a bunch of people <laughs> who are really good at drawing other people. And I'm shitty at it. And, and so that I, I need to practice that more. Uh, and so if I am conscious about what, where I need work, I can focus on that and do it. And so that's another thing is, is being honest about the things that, that we avoid uh, as sketchers, the, the subject matter that we tend not to embrace. And uh, because we maybe feel self-conscious about our own ability or lack of ability to draw that thing. And right. so uh, I would say, you know, going after drawings, finding drawings or parts of drawings um, 
where you say, wow, I really wish I could draw that. And, and really literally filling sketchbook pages uh, with practice is a really good idea. That's why I have books like these that are just, you know, they're not special. The, the paper is good. Yeah. But yeah, uh, they're cheap books, and you can fill pages with hatching practice or or trees. There's another like a little one that you know just sort of oh. practicing uh, trees, you know, right. in different ways. Uh, just okay. these basic little books to me are where I do my scales, where I do my practice, mm. and then you know when I'm ready, I can go out and paint something that's a little bit more wow. substantial. But it's really, you know, like these trees uh -huh. come from those trees that I just showed you. Yeah. It's right. practicing an element in isolation so that right. when it comes time for the complete drawing, I can, I feel comfortable. Uh, right. I'm not trying to make it up, you know? Right. Yes, and, and you've developed your sketching muscle, so that muscle memory gets right. in, and then the expression slowly can come. Right, okay. and you're not having to well, struggle and think about it, yeah. Right, yes. Okay, well, I, I'd really like to show some of your work, and I'm sure lots mm -hmm. of people want to look at that as well. Um, in the process, maybe you can tell us like how exercises like this, like these, can help yeah. uh, total beginners. How would that be relevant to them? Well, that, it actually relates quite a bit, that, that shed uh, in the three drawings, the two on the right and the one lower left, that was an old chicken coop um, behind a house that my wife and I lived in, in Eugene, Oregon. And, uh, and that was like a, an industrial building there in Eugene. And what this is showing is these are four drawings on a single sheet of paper. And that was a way that I used to go and practice. And part of it had to do with time, where I would give myself five minutes and then do another drawing. Five minutes, five minutes, five minutes, and I did that kind of over and over again, maybe 10 minutes at the most. Um, but repetition was what I was trying to do and focusing on simple techniques. So hatching in this case, and this is a chocolate pencil uh, was what this medium was. So like a kind of slightly waxy, slightly brownish um, kind of graphite. And, and just doing a simple drawing as quickly as possible from different point of view uh, each time and limiting how much time I was gonna spend on it. That's to go back to an earlier question, something that students often struggle with is there's an expectation that doing a drawing takes a long time Mm -hmm. And that the more the more you work on it, the better it's going to get. And I, I find that after, you know, at least with graphite, after five or ten minutes, uh, it's diminishing returns. Like, I, you know, you capture something quickly and then move on. And training myself to be able to do that was very, very valuable, especially as a teacher, to break people from the habit of investing a lot of time in a drawing that doesn't necessarily get better. At the other end of that spectrum, obviously, you see drawings like Le Pen has been putting up of his, you know, jade plants and that where it's it's really uh, a wonderful investment of time that he's putting into those drawings. So there there is a time and a place for practice drawing versus another approach to drawing, obviously. But that's what those drawings are about, about quickness. These ones, too, this is with a marker, black marker. Um, simplifying the medium, thinking carefully about directionality, and these are practice. This was when I was learning. These are not drawings that I, you know, I haven't looked at these in a long time, um, you know, but <laughs> they're, they were me figuring out how to deal with things like light in a line-based medium, in a black and white medium, and, and, and shade, and how that translated then to watercolor is where I found a lot of value in this kind of work, where I was really being rigorous about it and drilling into my head ways of, of capturing light and shade and material and surface. And then, you know, when it came, when it comes time to paint, I've got that in my mind. That's what's driving me uh, is to, like you were showing in Sherry's drawing or, you know, like this, like, 
reserving yeah. the white, like protecting the light in a drawing. That's uh, Thomas that, Schaller, by the way. Uh, Tom Schaller, he's on Instagram. He's, he's, uh, I took a workshop from him and he taught me a ton. Sherry taught me an enormous amount <laughs> about watercolor. Uh, I, I've been fortunate. I've had good teachers in that regard. Okay. Well, I, I, I see, I, I totally get that. And I, I think I love what you've been talking about so far about improving fundamentals, like from this and yeah. the study of light and how you can go then to more finished sketches like that. Well, those are Arthur yeah. Guptill's drawings. Oh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's from this book. And then there was another drawing that I think I sent where I, yeah, that is me learning from his drawing. So that's uh, Arthur Guptill's okay. drawings, okay. Okay. and I was literally practicing by looking at drawings. So to go back to the discussion about drawing from photos versus drawing from uh, drawings, I find more value in drawing from drawings because I'm learning someone else's techniques, mm -hmm. right? Uh, little by little, in little kind of quick studies, these are sketches, you know, these are from his book, little studies of how to represent things. And then filling my own sketchbooks with, uh, you know, partial copies of those drawings where I'm internalizing those techniques. Ah, okay. I, 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 I understand that because uh, I didn't go to art school, but I learned to draw from comic books. So hmm. I kind of wish that totally. I did more masters, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yep. I guess it's never too late. Well, I mean, between one thing, one thing I want to say about masters, I think each of us decides who the masters are. Um, don't, you know, don't let someone else tell you, oh, you need to learn from so-and-so. You need to learn from the people that, who you admire, the work that you aspire to be able to do. And as I said before, as long as that's a lot of different people, the masters are, you know, Sherry's a master, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, these are, Arthur Guptill, to me, is a master. I've learned so much from this guy's work, uh, you know, on how to do these kinds of things that it really changed the way that I approached drawing. But my point is, you know, you decide who the masters are. Mm -hmm. um, okay. La Pen is one of my masters. Paul Heaston, who I'm seeing <laughs> in here, he's one of my masters. Uh, there's a lot of masters out there, and I keep learning from them every time I look at their work. Yeah, I I still get that, and that it, this is one of yours, right? Yeah, that's okay, mine. That, that's from Rome. Yeah, and that and is there, I'm, you know, really trying to study light. Uh, and a, there's when I look at that drawing, I see so much that I learned from Arthur Guptill. Uh, wow. just in terms of focus and forcing shadows and contrast and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's, that is fabulous. Uh, I'm going to show a couple more pieces that you do because. Yeah. That and that's time, a Trani. Yeah. yeah the this color's is a little funky there, but, uh, that's, that was just a big, long study in, uh, hatching and representing this cliff that was coming down and all these buildings. Um, Hugo was, uh, that's that's where I met Hugo Costa. <laughs> it was in oh, Atrami wow. once. Yeah, and uh, because he was there studying, um, you know, the work of uh, Lu Khan and I was there with my group of students. So yeah, there's there's Hugo. Oh, you met, Atrani. You met up. <laughs> Atrani. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're, we're learning so much from these shows. I mean, you, you guys are recommending so many. <laughs> incredible things well i um i'm i'm really inspired by all the things that you're saying about fundamentals and all that and i guess this is part of your challenge right yeah so would you kindly explain that and what yeah. you'd like the audience to do what i'd like people to do is is find um a drawing that or a few drawings that you find really compelling uh and look for specific elements of a particular drawing that you want to learn how to draw that, that make you say, wow, I wish I could draw trees like that, or I wish I could draw arches like that, or whatever it is. Some element within a drawing 
and then practice variations of that element from the drawing that you found, just like I was showing with Guptel's work, and fill some, you know, just cheap sketchbook pages full of those variations, and then apply those elements or that element to a drawing of your own from observation. So again, if it's trees like you're shown here, or shadows, or people, um, materiality, whatever it is, you find something in a drawing, not in a photograph, but in a drawing, and learn how to make that part of your own skill set, one of your own kind of tools that you can use, and then make that part of your own drawing and show me the results, show all of us the results, you know, uh, identify what that is and and uh, see how that goes. Hopefully it will make those elements feel um, more comfortable to you, that, that you're able to include them in drawings without kind of thinking about it quite so much anymore. So that's the challenge. That's the challenge and it is a perfect one to improve and strengthen those fundamentals. So the one hour has already gone by so it's been amazing. Thank you so much, Matt, for being on the show. Thank you, Rob. Uh, I'm just gonna say hi, and oh, I'm just gonna, yeah, we gotta, we, this is a thing. We have to give Click. us a, a cheers, Matt. I'm looking cheers, forward to Rob. having, yeah, I'm looking forward to joining you someplace and sketching yeah. with you again. Yeah. And thank you so much for being on the show. So, yeah. Okay, yeah, we'll talk again. Thank you, Matt. Ciao, Rob. We'll see, see ya, ciao. Okay, and that was Matt, that was Sherry. If you just joined us, we are already at the top of the hour and it is time to wrap. Thank you so much for joining the show today. Please join the, give, us, give the challenges a chance if you haven't already. And if you've been inspired by a previous challenge, I wanted to let you know that you can always do any of the challenges that have been happening. Remember to tag USK Talks Challenges and post and we look forward to seeing what you do uh, if you join any of the challenges today please remember to tag the guests as well and have fun i mean sometimes you can you don't have that much time to learn but one of these challenges will give you something to think about and you can do something every week we're hoping to push you a little further inspire you a little bit more and improve get those sketching muscles going okay so just a little reminder our time will change uh, right now we are still at, on sundays 4 p.m gmt but that will change shortly we will announce and next week we've got another fascinating show for you it's called urban sketching for good now what is all that about tune in join us again next week and you will know so for now keep safe be healthy i know lots of people lockdowns are lifting Please be safe out there, keep sketching, and have an amazing week. We'll see you guys next week. And, in, and as I say goodbye, I'm going to just read off a few names. Thank you all for joining. Thank you all for your support. Thank you for all those flying hearts. Have an amazing time, people. Have a great week. Bye. Ciao.